Okay, so we're finally moving away from molecules, even though molecules are awesome and molecular biophysics has a lot of content. And we're finally moving on to uh, larger scale. Let's focus on some cells and then we'll eventually get to focusing on animal models, uh, larger multicellular organisms and the like. Uh, but today we're focusing on cell level techniques and just understanding what uh, different cells there are. So this is focusing, I guess we could call this microbiology techniques used in biophysics. That molecular biology is a field in and of itself, um, but a lot of the techniques that are used there uh, are then applied to biophysics if you wanna be understanding what's going on in the cell. So you have to have an understanding of that. So we're gonna be talking about um, how cells are categorized in terms of like a lot of culturing techniques um, and like the specific things that you have to consider with culturing. Uh, and then um, we're also gonna get into sterilization. I feel like an elementary school student sometimes like sounding words out when I'm writing them, but anyways. So we're gonna focus on like, how do you grow your cells? How do you select your cells? How do you make sure that they're not gonna be infected? And that's the focus today. And then next lecture, we're gonna talk about like the tools and the different techniques to measure those cells. So today with our schematic, we're focusing on our sample is cells. How do you make them happy? And how do you have the right cells for what you want to investigate um, as well? Uh, so all of this relates to picking model organisms uh, for your type of experiments. And when we use the terminology model organisms, what that means is that um, you want something that's well understood. Or controllable to the best of your abilities when you're designing your experiment. So these are uh, cell lines, uh, cell types that have um, their genotype, genotype and behavior um, well-documented. Um, they typically have some generic or generalizable features. So then you can take what you're finding for this model organism and then you can um, transfer those ideas or imply those with something that's more specific or well less well-documented. Um, so, I mean, this aspect of well-documented is like really about control, having one variable at a time, Working at a cell level, these are much more complex than working with individual molecules. So understanding what's going on um, within that cell can help you have good experimental design. Um, also an aspect of model organisms is that they're, um, I guess we can call this experimentally manageable. And what I mean would be like for the type of experiment that you're doing that let's say you wanna do microscopy. Well, if you wanna do microscopy, uh, your cells have to be optically transparent and not all cells are. So if you use something that's thinner or reasonable size based on the um, uh, optical sectioning, your Z focus of your objective, these are important things. Um, That's just one example. Other cells might, like maybe you need something that will interact with a specific type of surface, then you'll select a different type of cell. Um, and a big component of using model organisms is also so you can compare your results to the literature 
for other labs. So there's so many different types of cell types, so many different types of organisms. If everybody was using their own unique strain, sometimes that's applicable, but let's say instead of everybody using E. coli or yeast, we'll talk about these organisms. Everyone was using their own system. It would be very hard to compare those. It'd be very hard to review the literature. If you got a paper from someone and technically all scientific literature is supposed to be able to be reproducible, well, if you're using a specialized cell line that no one else has um, and no one else can access and everybody was doing that, it'd be very hard to repeat or have that concept in science. Um, so I mentioned that we'll be talking today a lot of um, techniques in microbiology. And since we're working at the cellular level in this terminology, uh, do you remember from the first lecture, some of the microscopy images you guys collected, like what's a typical size of a cell? You guys wanna throw that in the chat or on mute? Saying, yeah, so I say tens of microns is pretty uh, a rough number there. So Austin's saying hundreds. If you're working with E. coli or smaller ones, it might be a little bit less than 10 microns, more like five or six. But I'd say around that range, one to 100 microns, tens is most uh, organisms. And hence, right in the name, we have our micro here. Um, and in microbiology, uh, and what we're talking about, cells are ideal model organisms um, in some aspects because uh, you can isolate individual cells. So unicellular studies. So this is nice to remove that heterogeneity in the same way that back in September, we were talking about single molecule techniques and removing heterogeneity and uh, being able to understand the dynamics of one system. You can do the same thing at the cellular level. Um, so that's a nice thing about it, uh, that there are highly controlled environments as well. in cell culture, that you can influence the cell dynamics there. Or sometimes people who do cellular studies say it's like each individual cell is its own test tube that you can do an experiment in. Very complex test tube inside there, but uh, uh, controlled nonetheless. Um, and this aspect of isolating individual cells, this would be in contrast to if you were doing tissue studies, where that's gonna be like thousands of cells that can uh, influence each other with cell-to-cell -cell communication, um, changing their local environment and the like. So those are the ideal things with microbiology. But then note, as I have in this plate here, that cells grow in colonies. So depending on the type of work that you're doing, then depending on the type of experiment, realize you might be doing, okay, single cells, or you might be with these different cultures, even just isolating a single colony uh, within your growth plate, we're gonna talk about this. Even a single colony is more homogeneous than comparing different colonies. So uh, these cells can undergo spontaneous mutations. So even isolating a single colony can reduce that heterogeneity or give you information that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get in tissue environments. So to give you some perspective or what some of these common model organisms are that you'll find in the literature that you'll see people using, um, I'm gonna walk you through both bacteria and then eukaryotic 
cells as well. So um, most common one, I've already mentioned it, E. coli for model bacteria um, is nice because it's, if you wanna study gram negative bacteria. So if you remember back in lecture one, this means that it has uh, an outer and in, in, inner membrane. Um, it's nice because it has a somewhat limited genome. So 4,000 genes, they're all categorized, understood. Um, and even with E. coli, I realize that you can get E. coli from different sources, um, uh, that those different sources can then have different mutations. So the um, four main variants that you can get or you can see used in the literature, this terminology um, would be K12 E. coli, B, C, and W, where these letters are just saying, okay, this is coming from the line of cells that was extracted from, I think the K12 is the most common, and I think it's from a diphtheria. I have no idea how to spell that with a Y. I think from like the 1930s, or something or 1950s. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. It's in the leak chapter. Um, but these other lines could come from a different patient, different sample. Um, and these all can have slight variations with them. So when you see these type of letters, it's referring to uh, what the source is. So that's like some of the terminology to not be like when you're reading microbiology or method sections, like what do all these letters, numbers, combinations mean, like how I mentioned there's a lot of jargon in biophysics, that's uh, what it means in terms of the cell lines. Um, if you're interested, so this is gram negative, but if you're interested in a gram positive bacteria, the model organism is Bacillus subtilis. And with lots of these model organisms, I apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciation. Um, uh, and this is a gram positive bacteria, so it only has one membrane. And it's a soil derived bacteria. Um, a unique thing with uh, Bacillus is that it um, develops spores. So because of that, um, it's often used for cell shape studies. And we'll talk about this in eukaryotes as well, like how does the membrane change in bacteria is a nice thing that this is used for. And then finally, um, some model Organisms are used for and in study infection processes. So viruses are somewhat, I mean, people clearly study viruses and we know that, but uh, because of their smaller size, if you wanna understand like how infections happen, um, sometimes it's easier to use a model infectious bacteria. So these are called um, bacteriophages. And these are, understanding the infection type process um, and common ones that are used to understand infection in E. coli would be the lambda phage. And this is infects E. coli. Um, and it does have more DNA than a virus has. So because of that larger amount of DNA, it's easier to like track where the DNA is going, how it's inserting the DNA, how it's behaving within the host. Um, so uh, its DNA is 49,000 nucleotides long. And even the DNA itself is used in studies, if we're going back to like molecular studies, um, that you'll see studies that use lambda DNA um, for sequencing modeling because it's quite long um, and you can purchase it quite cheaply. 
Um, another phage is a mu phage. And this is, um, this DNA splices itself into the host genome. So an understanding that splicing process um, is why mu phages are used often as well. So the infectious models here are often used in co combination with E. coli. Um, and because of their size and their genome size, that's what makes them nice compared to studying smaller viruses. So those are some model organisms on the bacteria front. There's also model eukaryotes if you want to start increasing complexity, having membrane bound organelles as a reminder. Um, so these can be divided up into single cell organisms. And uh, Saccharomyces, this is the one I see the most. So the more common term that you'll hear is budding yeast. And that's what I have pictured here. Um, that this is the mother yeast cell. This is the daughter. And you can see in the cell division or yeah, the cell division process um, that the daughter cell, the resulting cell buds off of the starting one. Um, so because of this, it's used uh, often to look at cell division. Again, the membrane changes. So similar to the bacillus, um, in cell division in bacteria and membrane changes, budding yeast is what you'll see in eukaryotes. <clears throat> it's also used commonly in microscopy because of its optical transparency. So this is the one I see used most, but also I'm focusing a lot on microscopy. Um, some other single cell organisms. Um, your question? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I was wondering, like, for the name, like Saccharomyces, is like this is this, like the stack part, like, refer to a saccharide or anything like that, or? Yeah, I would think so. Um, also, because it's yeast. I mean, this is like the same as baker's yeast. I'm pretty sure. So, I mean, it's going to be um, consuming sugars. So that might have to. That's where I would guess where that name comes from. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious. So, like, thank you. So some other single cell organisms are trypanosoma brucei. I do not know any Latin. So um, that is a protozoan and it's commonly used for lipid synthesis studies. Another one, um, that's a plant single cell organisms. I'm not even gonna try to say this one. Is a type of algae. So it's commonly used for studying photosynthesis. So uh, the P450 and processes in chlorophyll. Um, and chloroplasts, this will be the model organism here. Um, so those are single cell organisms. There's also multicellular eukaryotes, obviously. Um, so if you want to understand more fundamental multicellular organisms uh, that are simple, again, that's a key thing with model eukaryotes. There's a Latin name for this guy. Um, so multicellular on a simple scale um, focuses on, I think this is tens, hundreds of cells or so. And it's nice to use for cell to cell communication. And 
and differentiation. So differentiation like means what cell types, um, like if you think of stem cells, those are gonna be like the starting cell, is it gonna turn into like skin cells, muscle cells, like if we're talking about the human um, body, that that's a whole area of biology, developmental biology of going as an organism develops, how does it determine what, how many different cell types, what cell types, where those cell types are. So this is a multicellular, very fundamental system to start studying that. Um, uh, so these are more on the fundamental side, but then there's also many eukaryotics, model, model eukaryotes that are human cell lines. And this is important for studying disease relating our work to health benefits, NIH funding and the type things like that. So if you want to study human cells, you have to work with an immortal cell line. So what I mean by this is that it can keep dividing and those cell lines can last and not be limited. So do any of you guys know what limits the lifetime or the number of times a cell can divide? Like senescence? Can you repeat? Oh, uh, senescence? Uh, 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 like, I think it's like, uh, like there are like various, various factors that prevent a cell like, pro, like from reaching, like um, from dividing apart, like after a certain state, mm -hmm. like um, telomeres and like other things related to that, I think, right? Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm looking for. And Colin and Jack also commented in there that it's gonna be the telomeres. I'm sorry, Todd, I just couldn't hear the first word that well. So that's why I was probably making a face on the camera trying to hear it. Um, so yeah, the telomeres. Um, so uh, the ends of your chromosomes, those get shorter and shorter with the number of cell divisions and that limits how long the cell can divide. Um, so that's called the Hayflick limit. So if you want to be working with human cell lines, they have to like overcome this limit or not have telomere shortening. So these are typically cancer cell lines. And do you guys know the most commonly used cancer cell line that's used uh, for human cell work? Yep, so Jack says HeLa. Um, have any of you guys read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, the book? Yes, and I guess Jack has. If you guys haven't read it, it's a pretty good, it's a good, very interesting book, not just on the scientific side, but just uh, human culture side, history. It has a whole bunch in there, so I highly recommend it. Where if you guys don't know, HeLa stands for Henrietta Lacks, um, the patient who's uh, Ovarian or uterine cancer was then led to be the HeLa cell line. Um, but there's many other immortal human cell lines um, and also other organisms, mouse um, and the like. So problem set for the last problem in that problem set has you guys go investigate and select uh, a cell line to understand what its source is from, like what uh, model organisms that you can use uh, for human or organism level cell lines. So I'm not going to go into detail there. You guys can investigate that a bit in the problem set. So any questions about the different model organisms at all? Now we're going to get into, there's lots of different ways in microbiology to categorize um, the different types of cells that you're working with, uh, um, their physical uh, properties, let's see, their colony properties, uh, their structure, how they're cultured. So I'm going to just go over a couple of those. So um, when you hear different types of Here you can see terms of like staph um, or 
cocco or strepto. Those are terms that you hear when you go to the doctor and the like, and that's related to um, the shape of the bacteria or the cells that you're using. Um, these are mostly, this description here is mostly, um, or this figure here is mostly for bacteria, but this also holds for also some eukaryotes and other terms for that. Um, but you can see that coccus means something that's round, bacillus will be that rod shaped. So when we're talking about the bacillus subtilis, that means it's a rod shaped um, uh, bacteria type cell. Um, there's filament type cells as well. Um, even helical, how you have these corkscrews and the like. So I'm not gonna term all of these, um, but realize that like there's, a, there's different um, terms used to define their morphology. Um, further on top of just the general shape, you can also, so this is mostly shape, but then also like the aggregates as well. So you can see this is diplo cocci because there's two of the round bacteria cells, strepto meaning like an entire line of them, um, tetra. So you can see there's lots of, um, of the Latin terminology to describe this. So a lot of this comes from people looking under microscopes, defining what they see um, using Latin for that and the like. Um, they can also be categorized by the colonies. So like I mentioned, um, uh, a lot of studies are focusing on unicellular properties or detection, but they're all going to grow in colonies if you're doing this on like a plate, which will which we'll talk about, I think on the next slide or so. Um, and when they're growing on a plate and you look at the colonies, people further classify them based on their shape, um, uh, how high up they are, their size is wet well. So um, this, these are the things if you're doing cell culture that then after uh, you culture those cells and you wanna see like, you wanna describe this in your lab notebook, uh, these are the types of terms that people use. Um, so these type of colony properties and uh, can help you determine uh, what strain and species of bacteria is growing or cells are growing. So when we talk about sterilization, if you see a uh, colony shape that you're not expecting, that might be pointing to the fact that you have um, contamination in your sample. Um, and even within a species, these properties can change. Guess it can vary based on the phenotype or genetic mutations. So this might be something that you wanna look at over time as well, based on like what genes are being expressed during that growth. Um, so you can see using the terms that are in this table, you can see down here that they described these colonies as circular, entire, where it has no spikes on the margins, um, convex, large, smooth, glistening, cream colored, and translucent. Um, while these are irregular, flat, wrinkled, rough, yellow, opaque, and the like. So this helps classify what type of species are growing in your culture plates. Um, there's even more categorization if you have bacteria, the flagella, type can be used um, where flagella are these um, protein rods that then have a protein motor at the membrane that then rotate and can 
help um, propel and motorize and move the bacteria. And based on where those flagella are, those can be, you can see the different term, terminology down here. Um, that's another way of categorization for just um, bacteria. And then in terms of like, you can do categorization in your technique of culturing. So for your culture type, how are you growing these cells? And I have the two examples down here where you can have adherent. So this is gonna be on a culture plate or some type of substrate. And these can also be like in a 3D substrate, like a thick hydrogel. We'll show some examples on the next slide. And um, adherent cell culture is for most vertebrae. Um, cell lines. So any human cell culture is typically done on a culture plate. Um, and this is important because cell adhesion is needed for the cells to grow and propagate. Um, so cell adhesion means um, at the base, you have like your cell here, this is a nucleus, this is your substrate at the bottom, there has to be connections for the cell to adhere. Um, so these are called focal adhesions. And these are proteins that adhere to the substrate. So typically this is integrin proteins or you'll decorate your surface with just a peptide, RGD. So those are the letters for the peptide um, that's in the integrins um, that the integrins in the cells recognize and then adhere to. So having those forces, we're going to talk about cell forces on Thursday, is needed for these cells to be like, okay, I'm happy. Um, I want to uh, consume the media. I want to grow. I want, I want to form a colony here. Uh, so that's an important thing. Um, and with adherent cultures, the growth is only limited by the surface area. In your culture plate. The opposite one here is going to be your second option would be a suspension. So this is more typically used um, when you're just trying to grow a lot of cells. Um, uh, more used for bacteria, I would say, or yeast. Um, you need uh, culture flasks. This is shown with a round jar, but you'll also see Erlenmeyer flasks. You'll see test tubes um, are for these suspension growths. And the limiting factor here is you need to have adequate gas exchange. So without oxygen, most of the cells, unless you're using a special type of cell that is anaerobic, um, uh, if you're using aerobic cells, you need to have enough oxygen circulating through. So you can see like half of this is left empty. So then the oxygen can be there. There's vents here at the top. And then you typically need to agitate on a rocker, on a shaker um, to ensure that there's gas exchange here. Um, and also to note with these pictures I have here, um, you can see that for this culture growth, you can see this red color here. Do any of you guys know, I don't know, are any of you guys doing cell culture? And if so, do you know what like the red color is used for? What it is or what it's used for? So if no one, okay, yeah, Jack says pH. So yeah, so this is fennel red and it's a pH indicator. So your pH goes out of the desired range that makes cells happy. It'll turn, I think, like yellow or pink and it will tell you, okay, your pH is way off. Um, that's gonna damage your cell culture, slow things down, possibly kill yourselves. Um, so this red color is used if you're focused on just 
growing cells or if you're not planning on doing any optical techniques. Uh, if you're planning on doing optical techniques, obviously this bright red indicator is going to interfere if you're doing fluorescence um, or the like. So uh, important to know your experiment. And I know at least for me, when I've done some collaborations with um, some more microbiology groups, like I'm like, you can't use that uh, indicator here. So I've copied this from the Thermo Fisher website. Uh, I'm not gonna read all this to you, but here are some guidelines for helping select a cell line. And like, maybe you're not doing that in lab, maybe in the future you're writing a proposal and you have to like pitch like, okay, in the long term, I want to be using, uh, move my molecular experiment into cells, which is like, I'm just saying this is an example because that's what I do. And um, this type of guidelines help, like you want to consider like, okay, biosafety. That's why like a lot of the model organisms I'm talking about uh, are commonly used, but also they're less of a hassle to use. Um, if any of you guys have taken the biosafety training, you know, human derived cell lines, hepatitis, C vaccine, hepatitis B vaccines, that um, at biosafety level two, you have to consider that. But if you move up to three or four, that's when you're starting to work with infectious materials. So using um, non-human cell lines, that's gonna be like biosafety level one, you don't, and that helps um, have fewer biosafety restrictions, even non-infectious things are easier as well. Um, I think the main thing, I'm, this is a long list, but I think the huge thing to consider is what is the purpose of your experiments. You want to pick a model organism, a model cell line that fits with your experiments and also fits um, with your end goal and your functions of, okay, what are you trying to investigate? If you're trying to investigate, let's say like something related to human disease or cancer, it would make more sense to use like a HeLa cell line instead of like E. coli, obviously. But if you're trying to do something that's like very fundamental, let's say you're looking at like phase separation in any type of cell, um, maybe using yeast or bacteria would be more beneficial and easier to do. Um, Cause also, Let's see, I think it's down here, like the stability, like how, yeah, here, this growth conditions and characterizations, like the growth rate, you're working with E. coli or yeast, that's gonna have a faster doubling time compared to using human cell lines. Uh, human cell lines will also be more finicky, like if you wanna just make a whole bunch of cells and you wanna do suspension. So these are things to consider. Um, and don't, another point is don't just use a cell line because, okay, people in the literature are using this. Think of your end goal. Maybe this other lab is using one cell line, but you want to get more advanced than that. It doesn't make sense to use that same cell line. Um, so paying attention, reading the literature is good, but trying to understand why they're using the microbiology techniques they are, not just like, oh, they're just doing that because other people did that. That takes... It takes time, it takes effort, it takes critical thinking, but it will help in the long run as opposed to just repeating uh, what other people have done. Um, any questions at this point? Okay. Just a little bit more left. Um, switch the order uh, here about getting into a little bit more detail of how cells are cultured. We were just talking about the suspension versus adherence. Um, and we talked about the phenyl red um, in those solutions and that phenyl red is in the media. So that's the solution of nutrients that keep your cells happy. allows them to grow, like basically their lunch. Um, so there's different, again, there's like so much categorization in microbiology that there's um, defined media, 
And this means that you have a medium that all the chemical species are known. So I believe Lennox broth, that's why I've done E. coli culture in, is one of those. So you know exactly how much glucose is in there, how much um, chemicals are there. The opposite of that would be a complex media. Complex media, media, plural, singular. And that means that like the chemical species aren't all known. And what that means is that you have some bio-derived component in that medium. So maybe you have broken down uh, lysed yeast in there, let's say. The amount of chemicals, amount of proteins that are in that batch of yeast can vary uh, over time. So you don't know the exact species, you know it works, it's not worth for the manufacturers to like for each batch determine how much is in there. So there's some slight variability in there. So this is typically used if you need like growth factors or other proteins or signals that are in the media that help uh, your cells grow. Um, so these two kind of go together. Another way of categorizing your medium include uh, selective and enrichment. So selective medium means that it hinders the growth of some species and your um, of some microbes there. So an example of this would mean like you put an antibiotic in your medium. So I've done this where when we talked about producing proteins or producing biomolecules, we talked about the plasmids that you can use. You can use a plasmid that includes like a, a section for like antibiotic resistance. So like acetaminophen um, and you can put acetaminophen in your medium that will hinder the growth of any bacteria that doesn't have that plasmid in it. Um, the opposite of this would be an enrichment medium. Um, so this would promote growth of a specific species. As well. So these are different categorizations of what type of media that you use. Um, we talked about the suspended versus the uh, culture plate type methods. So over here, I have some example images where this is like a suspension um, in a test tube um, and can be used for, the main thing here is that this is being used for batch growth and it's also rapid. <laughs> you can also grow culture in some agarose gel here. So this is agar. Um, so this is an agar slant. And this has a large surface area um, and you can temporarily store an actively growing culture up here. Um, so this green is your culture, the clear is the agar and it's like slanted over. Um, and then you can also, this also has agarose here where this is called the agar stab. And this is for if you want to limit oxygen. So if you're working with an anaerobic species, you can see there's like a needle stabbed in here. So you take from a culture plate one colony that you want to grow, you put that on a, a pipette or a needle, you can then stab that into the agarose and it's going to grow within here. But any uh, microbes that are present that need oxygen will then die off. So that's um, some options. And then for some culture plates, you can see down here that you can do a streak plate where I think in this plate it's divided up like this where you have different conditions 
in each of these different areas and you streak, let's say you grow some bacteria in suspension and then you want to move it to grow colonies, you can then streak it over the entire plate um, in specific areas or you can also spread it over here. So this would be spreading an entire solution. This streak would be taking a small area and taking like a Q-tip type swab, con swab, and streaking it in specific areas. So you'll see some fun art images that microbiologists do. I saw someone write vote in different colored types of bacteria on a streak plate, which is kind of cool. Um, and in all these different culturing methods, it's important to know what cells you're using, obviously, and what makes them happy. So you need to understand like the temperature, the oxygen levels, like any inorganic compounds, like salt or magnesium, like sodium, magnesium, and the like that make them happy. And if you're using a different cell line than what you're seeing in the literature, you likely won't be using the same type of conditions. That these are quite finicky for the different cells that you're using. So again, being informed with what you're doing uh, is important. And the last thing I want to cover is contamination and also biosafety. That's um, a huge thing with cell culture and propagating cell lines is ensuring that there is no cross-contamination. So uh, this concept is aseptic techniques. is the technical terminology of pre preventing contamination. Um, so also called like sterile techniques. So I have some equipment shown here, but what are some, I guess, um, chemicals, methods, uh, harsh conditions that help kill bacteria? What are some things that you can use to sterilize um, bio safety or bio equipment or microbiology equipment. You guys want to throw those in the chat or on mute? Yeah, so Colin's saying ethanol, UV light. Alcohol. Any other solutions or I guess equipment um, temperatures that you guys can think of. Some other uh, solutions include bleach solutions. You'll see often in microbiology labs. Um, the important thing is like this degrades with light. And so you need to use it quickly or make it fresh. So I do want to note that, um, that you can't always trust a bleach solution if it's been sitting around a lot. Um, another way to sterilize things that's commonly used is by heat, by using um, Bunsen burners. So just passing something through a flame uh, will burn any, any bacteria that's on there um, that you don't want to use. So some more specific equipment that I've shown here include autoclaves, which are just like really fancy dishwashers that use pressure. So you get up to like 15 PSI, 121 degrees Celsius, and that will then sterilize um, any bacteria that's present. Um, so on campus, I know, at least in the quad, that bioengineering in Wickedon has some autoclaves. That's the only place I found them. They're quite janky and old, but they definitely still work and sterilize things. Um, and I'm sure in the 
School of Medicine, there's probably a ton of autoclaves uh, as well. Um, and then also just wanted to know, working with your samples, with your culture, you can see this woman here working with her cultures. This is in a biosafety cabinet. And in contrast to chemical hoods, chemical hoods are more designed to protect your sample that's in the hood from, protect you from your sample, from noxious fumes and all of that. Like a biosafety cabinet is different. It has, it's protecting, it's more designed to protect your sample from yourself to prevent this type of contamination. Um, unless it's like a biosafety three cabinet is for infectious materials and it's designed both ways to prevent you infecting your sample and your sample infecting you. But most biosafety cabinets you'll see are type two cabinets and those are preventing you from infecting your sample. So this is designed with like HEPA filters um, to catch any microbes that are floating in the air. And then also the airflow, that how you're working in the direction of the airflow in the biosafety cabinet, the air comes down this way. Okay, I'll actually double check that. I think it comes down the, I'll have to double check the airflow, but it's designed so the airflow prevents um, air coming in from the outside and blowing on the samples. So you'll, there's vents here that will blow air up um, as well. And it's very important when you're working in a biosafety cabinet to know where those airflow, where that airflow is going. Um, so you don't disrupt it and then actually bring in the microbes that then will contaminate your sample. Um, so those are, that's some, I guess, practical use there. Um, so that's what I had today. Chapter seven in leak where it has all the miscellaneous stuff talks about these model organisms. And a lot of those figures I had were from this ATCC website where you can purchase cell lines, um, but they also, uh, I think it was founded back in the thirties, but it's a nonprofit organization to try to standardize um, the different cell lines um, for scientists to use and uh, they authenticate them too. So that's a key thing that if you read that Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, that um, back in the 1960s, they found that like HeLa cells are so prolific that they actually contaminated other cell lines and then grew and people published results finding all this crazy stuff in cell lines and it was actually not the cell lines they were investigating, it was actually HeLa cells. So if you are using a cell line from someone else, you have to typically get it authenticated by sending it out to service um, or just buy your own cell lines from ATCC where they have already authenticated all those. So that's, I guess, a practical source of where you can get your uh, cell lines in addition to things like Thermo Fisher and the like. Um, so are there any questions at all?